Well, happy Tuesday afternoon, everyone. It is a gloomy day, but we here from Pasadena Humane and Kids Space are going to bring a little sunshine to your day. So, Miss Lonnie, how are you? I'm fabulous now, Michelle. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing just about amazing. Um, and what about you, Miguel? How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. And I'm glad to be back. Happy to be back here. Yeah, we're happy to have you and it's kind of bittersweet because this is our very last watercolor, wildlife and watercolor. So we're excited. We're a little sad at the same time. So I, we hope everybody in the audience uh, is excited for this session as we talk about the monarch butterfly and not to be mistaken, the legless lizard. Okay. So before I turn it over to you guys, uh, we're going to go through some webinar remarks. Reminders. I don't think it's showing me screen. There we go. All right. So, as a reminder to everyone who may be joining us for the very first time, this is an audio visual presentation. So, even though you can see and hear us, we cannot see and hear you. If you've got any questions to ask of Ms. Lonnie about your artwork or of Miguel about the animal, the, uh, yeah, the animals that we're learning about today, go ahead and drop them in the chat box. If you can wait till the end, great. But I know sometimes those thoughts just pop into our mind and we've got to get them out. Um, today, we will be talking about the monarch butterfly and the legless lizard. As usual, we want to see the artwork that you create. So go ahead and you can send it to this link here and I'll drop that in the chat box. Um, this recorded webinar is so it'll be mailed to you tomorrow afternoon and you can watch it as many times as you like. Okay. And we have some upcoming programs in 2022. Super exciting. Our Animal Adventures Workshop. Um, where we're going to be talking about becoming a veterinarian, wildlife edition, uh, our Kids for Animals Club, and our academy is going to start, and we'll have Scout Sundays coming back. Okay, so keep an eye out in your email and on Eventbrite for more information. And without further ado, go ahead and take it away, guys. Hey, everyone. Okay, so this is our last one. I'm super excited. I hope everyone is tuned in with us for a while. Please, please, please share all of your past designs with us and all the many times we've done this. And Miguel's, I'm so excited to have you on again. Before we get started, just wanna remind you guys, basically two watercolor sheets. Uh, you can get, you can use regular paper. You can also use watercolor paper. This is my favorite because it's strong enough to kind of take in all the water. Um, and I went ahead and pre-drew everything for this episode. At this point, you guys should have already received your templates or Michelle did an amazing draw, job in dropping them in the chat below. So you can go ahead and download those. Um, what's really good about this, uh, the ones I drew this time, is in the stencils you'll see that all the detail work is there. So you can kind of start working on it as we're talking. Um, first one we're actually going to work on is the butterfly. So I actually just want to take note as we're working on it, you can be outlining your butterfly as we speak. Um, and I went ahead and I'm just going to dark line this stuff with you guys for a minute so you guys get comfortable with it. My camera started falling. <laughs> so before we get started, as you can see, I basically did a really large teardrop towards the very top and kind of middle center of the butterfly. Uh, we went ahead and outlined the abdomen, which makes it a lot easier for you guys to kind of recognize um, where to put the rest of the butterfly pieces. And then if you go ahead and the trick here is finish outlining the butterfly wing. So in the stencil, you can see where the where the wing kind of goes into the abdomen part. And then you basically just add the bottom parts of all the teardrops along here. They're kind of different variations and shapes like so. And then the trick here and the key here is to make sure to add a couple of dots here, but you got to make them big enough. So when you do the watercolor, they don't just get lost and the paint gets painted over. Um, and so the same thing with the bottom, you can kind of replicate from the design that is uh, available to you online with the template, how to go ahead and start with the bottom piece. Um, and what we're gonna do here um, at the end is <clears throat> probably just add like a really chill, like green organic background. The next one we're gonna work on is the legless lizard. 
So it looks a lot like a snake. So you can go ahead and draw it out the way that the outline gives you. And then, but I would say that from what this point, like right under where you would see where his neck is, you're gonna go ahead and just kind of put like a little wrinkle line there. And then up here, you're giving him definitely a very like, I would say a prehistoric face. Would you say that, Miguel? Yes, very um, lizard-like. You know, so very it's lizard -like. definitely um, very much like a Jurassic Park vibe. Um, and then the difference here with him is with his eyes, they are very, um, very they're very snake-like. The difference is that with the legless lizard, they do have eyelids, correct, Miguel? Correct, they do have eyelids, unlike snakes. Okay. Awesome. So, so here we go. When you guys finish drawing this outline here, you'll see the difference here is there is a line, a ridge line here, sort of in the center. And that actually dictates the difference between the legless lizard and the snake. And why would that be, Miguel? The lateral line? Yeah, that lateral line. Yeah, it's basically, it, um, snakes don't have it. It's unique to certain species of lizards, especially the legless or the ones with short legs like our native um, alligator lizard. It allows them to um, expand or compress their body um, if they need to squeeze in or expand, like say if it's a female carrying eggs, they could expand their body a little bit more. They're not as flexible or stretchy as snakes. So that lines what helps some kind of, you know, um, stretch a little bit as they need to or compress. Awesome. Okay, guys, so we're going to actually start on the butterfly. So we're going to use sunset colors for the butterfly because it's a monarch. And so, as you can see, this is kind of the colors I'm going to use um, right here. So it's going to be oranges to yellows. And I'm actually going to start with the top and the bottom. We're going to go from yellow to kind of an orange color. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on that. And just so you know, as we keep working, the next part will be outlining the butterfly and coloring the black. So as Miguel is talking about the butterfly, you guys can kind of see it based on my directions, what we're doing. And then finally, after that, we're just going to add like a nice green or blue background. It's really your call. So Miguel, are um, monarchs from this area, from where we're from, where we are here in L.A.? Yeah, there's um, they're found in two parts there. You know, there's the Western population and the Eastern population. So, yes, they, they travel all throughout. Um, California, probably up to like the Mendocino County, and they go all the way down into um, central Mexico. They migrate about 3,000 miles each time they do. Wow. And how long are they there for, Miguel? It depends. Um, when they're overwintering, they're there for about like six to nine months because it takes them a while to get down there. I mean, they travel 3,000 miles and they takes them, they take what, they fly about an average of 50 to 100 miles per day. So it takes them a while to get there, then they overwinter and then they fly back up, they make the migration back up. That's really interesting. And so um, in terms of sort of where they go exactly, what parts of Mexico do you know? Um, they go all the way from Northern, or is it Northern Baja even, I guess I would say southwestern, even in the central Mexico, all throughout. Um, they just have to find the proper um, areas that habitat so they could overwinter, which is basically areas they could sustain them and have enough um, milkweed too so they could live and um, reproduce. And, and milkweed is what exactly for our, some of our listeners who may not know? Milkweed is the type of plant that um, the monarch uniquely. Um, eats and goes from, that's why it is, um, it's a milkweed, so it is a toxic um, plant. So it makes the, um, the monarch butterfly, like many other butterflies, um, poisonous. So many birds or you know insects, mainly birds who go after them, they get really sick if they eat one. And that's one of the reasons why you're, you know, the colors you're using are basically warning colors telling, especially birds and other animals that wanna eat them, like, hey, stay away, I'm dangerous. You know, I'll make you sick <laughs> if you eat me. 
Awesome. Um, what other de defense mechanisms do they have? Pretty much that's it. They're bright colors and then the toxicity. Other than that, they're, um, there's not really much they could do with. They really, they're actually kind of known in the um, natural habitat for like some birds do avoid them, but there's like some birds um, that aren't, they could eat a bunch of them and they don't get sick. Like there's certain Orioles or Gosbeak birds, they're called Gosbeaks. Um, they're, apparently they're somehow they've evolved where they could eat a bunch of monarchs and they don't get sick. Wow, that's cool. So they're the, all the predators actually they they don't want to eat them, right? Regular right. predators that eat other animals don't even mess with them. <laughs> that's exactly. pretty cool. That's um, why some other butterflies yeah. have adopted the coloration to try to pretend that they're monarchs so they don't get eaten as easy. Oh, okay. And what other what other um, butterflies or animals mimic butterflies in that same way, Miguel? Can you give us an example? Yeah, like in the butterfly world, um, the painted lady is the one that's most commonly um, does it. They're a lot smaller though. They're only about like six centimeters and the monarchs are about double their, almost double their size at 10 to 11 centimeters like wing length. But they look, they look the same color wise, but their pattern is different. Like you have all, see how you have a kind of like those lines that we call veins in their wings? Uh, monarchs yeah. have that. The painted ladies don't. They have like blotches of color, like circles, kind of like they're like blotched out. They don't have those fine lines and uh, markings, which we call veins, that monarchs have. Um, painted ladies don't have that. Also, painted ladies um, have erratic flight, kind of like moths. You know, they just kind of, you know, they're just kind of zigzagging all around. Versus the monarch being bigger, they have that nice, graceful kind of um, soaring kind of flight, where they're just kind of constant. They're nice, calm flight. You see them just kind of flap and just kind of soar and then flap and then just kind of soar versus painted ladies are just kind of flap, 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 flap. Oh, interesting. Um, are monarchs more aggressive by nature? I wouldn't call them more aggressive. No, they're actually, they're, they're pollinators. So basically they go around when they're um, nectar, which is what they like to, most butterflies get. And then they pick up pollen along the way. And as they go from flower to flower, they help actually um, uh, perpetuate native uh, plants. And with having more native plants means more native animals. So they help the ecosystem a lot, which is why it's important to um, try to conserve the habitat that they have left because they're actually in danger now. I see. Okay. So um, are they actually, actually before I keep asking, so you guys, what I did was just, you can keep adding more details to your color. You could make this a lot darker than this one. But I'm going to go ahead and get started on just outlining all of the inside because this actually takes a long time. Um, if for whatever reason you don't have a brush that is conducive to help kind of do that, I would recommend using like a fine tip pen if you wanted to really get it dark. So what about socially, Miguel? Are they very social animals, creatures? <laughs> well, I guess they kind of do because they migrate together. But usually when they're just out within there, they just kind of go about their business, you know, going and pollinating and reproducing but yeah it's especially like i think it's the fourth wave of population in the years the one that is the one that migrates they're the ones that tend to be more cohesive and um you know of course migrate together along the way all the way down either up north or all the way down depending if it's uh depending where they're going to overwinter um uh, and also depending on the season where winter is versus where it's not it always goes vice versa yeah like birds do you know they fly south for the winter how everyone says that yeah um and then what what do they actually eat other than milkweed are there any other plants like can people in the garden actually encourage these animals yes they could by actually by actually planting milkweed um unfortunately that's one of the reasons they're kind of they're in danger too is because milkweed you know the word weed is in there so a lot yeah. of people consider them a weed so they don't plant them or they actually pull them from the yard so yeah. what you could do to promote that is just to leave milkweed alone or Go out to your local nursery or garden and ask for milkweed to plant that in. You'll get these beautiful butterflies cut showing up to your yard and, you know, doing that and pollinating and helping perpetuate, you know, native plants. And also, too, that also perpetuates native wildlife. So you might see more native wildlife in your year, too, by planting a nice garden or a butterfly garden, so to speak. That's so awesome. You know, Miguel, that really reminds me, too. Um, I signed up for Debs Park, the Audubon Center and they send you even through Instagram, and I think they do it through email, 
they'll let you know seasonally when they are actually giving plants away mm -hmm. and you can actually go pick up uh you know plants that are actually encourage uh wildlife which is butterflies and all the native uh, bugs and things in the habitat that will better kind of sustain monarchs and all the other butterflies, right, Miguel? Yep, exactly. Yeah, and it's so cool because people think that these plants aren't, maybe they're not as pretty as like your traditional plants that you might buy at the garden store, but I mean, they're there for a reason and, and to try to keep our plants as local as possible and encourage these animals to thrive in our neighborhood. So that's a really good point you're making. What other fun things can you tell us about the monarch, Miguel? Um, let's see. They actually, they don't live very long. People usually ask how long do they live is a common question I get asked. And it's normally the first three generations, which are the ones that don't migrate, the ones that stay local to their area, they only live two to six weeks after they be emerge and become butterflies. Wow. And yeah, they don't live very long, so they have a short lifespan. And the ones that do, it's like usually the fourth generation of that year that the ones that do the migrating, they usually live the longest, which is um, six to nine months. Wow. And do they have um, a lot, do they, do they have a lot of babies or eggs, I guess, right? Uh, they lay, they only lay about one or two eggs per plant. They don't live, they don't like um, lay a whole bunch, which is also another reason like, you know, it's important like the plant those things, but they, but since there's a lot of them, they, they're pretty hardy, so they tend to hatch out, but if they survive it all the way to becoming a chrysalis, uh, and then emerging to be a butterfly, that's, that's key. And that's another question, I use the word chrysalis. Um, another question is like, don't they use cocoons? It's like, no, cocoons is what, the term we use for moths, they actually, cocoons is um, that worm, the caterpillar actually spins a, you know, web of silk, and they actually, are in it and then they emerge from it versus um, a chrysalis is what um, a caterpillar actually sheds into they actually become the chrysalis which is kind of the ache you know the cocoon so to speak so that's yeah. what they become they don't spin a cocoon they don't spin the silk and be go into it they actually become the cocoon so to speak which we call a chrysalis wow that's so cool so they become it yep. they're not in it they're nope. it <laughs> Yep. That's really cool. And it's funny because people don't know that, right? They'll they'll just say cocoon. Right. They'll just say, yeah, they're synonymous, you know, but no, that um <laughs> it drives bug people crazy because like, no, it's not a cocoon, it's chrysalis. But you know, it's just part of like that's why we do things like this to educate people. So like, hey, you know what? Um moths, you know, spin cocoons, that's what they emerge from. Butterflies emerge from chrysalis. Yeah. And Miguel, why do you know so much about them considering you're our reptile guy? <laughs> Well, I'm an animal guy, you know, I just have a, my, my love, my passion has always been reptiles, but um, here at Kidspace, we have an annual um, butterfly um, event where um, people can come and adopt caterpillars and um, take them themselves and they watch them turn from a tiny caterpillar all the way into a chrysalis and, and the ones we normally get are painted ladies, which are like the mimics of the monarch. And then we also, we encourage the kids to come back to Kidspace and release them here at Kidspace into the Arroyo. That's, That's so a cool. very popular thing to do. And then during that whole time, we're talking about butterflies and the importance of butterflies and their life cycle and, you know, what they do and their purpose here in the environment. So we use it as a, um, a platform to educate, you know, not just kids and adults about the importance of, you know, all life, including butterflies. And Miguel, why why is it so so important to keep uh, the butterflies kind of flying around us here? Well, like I said earlier, just to, um, they since they eat nectar, they actually you know they're pollinators. So you know bats, bees, butterflies, you know they're pollinators. So they actually go around you know with the pollen going down, helping plants um, you know from propagate seeds, make seeds, and then that you know from that you know comes new new plant life so they basically help um uh help replicate the native plants in their environment so which that's important because without them and other pollinators we wouldn't have all these plants and also too which a lot of the native wildlife rely on too you know so which is good it's kind of nice to know that butterflies have an important role in the environment not just looking pretty and flapping around in our yards exactly and i think you made a good point by using the word propagate and for my friends who don't know what propagate means, 
basically we're spreading out more greenery throughout our neighborhoods, right? Because it's really important to keep keep the green around. Yep. Um, we see yep. all these people building everywhere, and it destroys all these habitats for our animals, right? Yep. Yeah, new buildings are you know we pull like we redo our landscape and we pull all the native plants just to put fancier, nice, you know, more exotic plants that look prettier and stuff, which you know then you know starves out the native wildlife because it's not what they're used to eating. Absolutely. And what about, can you tell us a little bit about their antennas that I'm painting right here? Um, you know, they use that pretty much to sense, you know, their, um, it's part of their receptor system, which is kind of cool. With, and with their legs and ears, like they basically sense like wind and so forth. So it, it's one of their sensory organs, which is really nice. Um, many insects have them, you know, most um, insects have them. You know, ants, you know, they're popular, they do too. It's the way they, it lets them interpret the world, you know, without having, you know, the typical eyes that we think of when we think of mammals and ourselves. Got it. And so, Miguel, if I were to put this butterfly, let's say you guys were just painting a common, you guys can just draw like a really organic leaf. Why would they be on a leaf like this a lot of times? Well, sometimes they could be, if they're just emerging from like their chrysalis, they're, they would be on top of a, a wing like that, just to, you know, they're like that, letting their wings dry out before they take full flight. Or say if it's a day like this and they, act, you know, during that time of year when they're around, they would actually be, it's kind of, it would be like if we were looking underneath them and they use the underneath of a leaf to protect them from the rain and the water. Oh, so so That's they're either, you know, they're either drying out or trying to keep drying. It's one of those, it's one of the two common reasons you would just see them on a leaf like that. Um, and then if, would there any be any reason for them to be like under a leaf for any reason? Yeah, that just to avoid weather, like in, like today where it's kind of, um, you know, overcast and it's kind of rainy throughout the day, they would go underneath the leaf to protect themselves. Cool. So it's, it's almost like to keep, you know, if it, other than not being a milkweed, if it's just a you know just a uh, leaf from another uh, bush or tree or whatever, it would be basically um, it's ironic. They're either drying out usually from recently emerging, or underneath, or they're taking a break from. And if they're in, if they're migrating, they'll usually go underneath the leaf and just kind of you know stay out of sight from predators because they like I said they average like 50 to 100 miles per day in their travels when they're migrating. Wow. So they need a break. Yeah. But, so they'll, um, they'll just kind of rest underneath a uh, leaf for protection just from predators and the elements, depending where they're at. Well, that makes sense, because I think I've always wondered, like, where do they go? Because then you'll see them in the middle of the day, and then you don't see them anymore. Sometimes you'll see a bunch of them congregate. Like, if you get a mid-migration, it's kind of cool. They'll be, like, under, um, they'll actually be on the barks of trees. They'll just kind of be on trees all right there, and on, just because there's a lot of um, uh, shelter from the tree. Yeah. So they'll be there too. So they'll just always seek um, shelter from the elements. Like so, basically, they want cover. So if they find oh, a good cool. tree, they'll do that, and they'll just you know hang out there and rest before they fly another fifty to hundred miles. That's so neat. So how do you like it, Miguel? You like it? Very pretty. Yep. Yeah, I'm really excited to see other people's work. This was a really quick, quick paint job, guys. So. Feel free to add more details. We would love to see it. And I know Michelle has some awesome trivia for you guys, too. Yep. And you drew a female butterfly. That's cool. Oh, did I? Yep. How can you tell? Oh, because um, on the lower wings, the, the ones you painted kind of yellow, you see like those um, veins, those lines. On males, one of those veins would have a dark dot on it, um, right in the middle of it. And it would be on each side of the wing. So if they have two dots on one of those um, veins, they're basically males. It's their pheromone glands wow to help them um, attract females and also make some you could actually distinguish them from male from female butterfly cool all right well we get, i know uh michelle's got some trivia for us i do i do i was very interested <laughs> in knowing the difference because monarch butterflies are one of my favorites um, yeah they're beautiful okay so number one how fast can a monarch butterfly flap its wings? Uh, one to six beats per minute, five to 12 beats per minute, 11 to 18 beats per minute, or more than one beat? Hmm, I'm curious what people say, Michelle. 
Yeah, well, I have a feeling that the answer is actually going to surprise most of everyone. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this poll now. And it is actually 5 to 12 beats. Ooh. So even though it seems like they, I mean, they can fly great distances, it takes them quite a, a while because they're not beating their wings as fast as other butterflies. Interesting. Okay. Yep. And if they were um, listening, the beginning, numbers, the difference between the painted lady and the monarch was the painted lady just kind of flaps in his erratic flight, you know, versus the monarch's very majestic and only just kind of, you know, flaps and kind of glides around. Yeah. All right. So number two, when were monarch butterflies first introduced to Australia? Just 1870, 1895, 1942, or 1956? I know Miguel did tell us that the monarch butterflies are native to our area. So how in the heck, when did they get to another country? We're going to go ahead and close up in three, two, mm. and one. So those of you that said 1870 are absolutely correct. And they actually got over to Australia in a windstorm. So, and then the last question, wow. uh, the monarch butterfly is the official insect of the United States. Is this true or false? Hmm. Ooh. Blake decision right now. Uh, this is very, <laughs> very interesting. I don't know, Michelle, you get tricky sometimes. I, you know, I try. I love the interesting <laughs> facts. And then like kids can go to school tomorrow and say, hey, guess what? Did you know? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close this poll up. It is deadlocked. 50% true and 50% false. So Ooh. I will say that this is a false statement. It is the state insect of Texas, Minnesota, Idaho, Illinois, and Alabama, and the state butterfly of Vermont and West Virginia, but not the official official insect of the United States. So, and then Lonnie, before you move on, yeah, before you move on, we have one audience question about the monarch. Um, so Miguel, when they migrate to Mexico and such, um, do what kind of trees do we see them clinging to? What kind of what? Trees. Um, I don't, I don't recall if they're specific ones, but they generally, um, They go for basically, I think they go for, uh, I think here in California, they go for eucalyptus. I'm not sure exactly which ones they hit in Mexico, but I know here they like the eucalyptus one, the eucalyptus trees on their way. All right, hmm. all right, go. All right, answer your show, Lonnie. I'm on it. <laughs> all right, guys, so the next thing we're gonna do is pick our cool color for our legless lizard. Miguel's our pro here. So Miguel, which color uh, do you recommend? I guess one, two, or three? Hmm, I would say close, I'd say maybe three. Okay, so we're down here. All right, guys, that's the color for our legless lizard. I know that Miguel has an awesome friend to share. So yeah, try to focus on that. It's compared colors. Oh no, that's so different than what I have. Should I go well, more sand? It doesn't come out as good on camera. I mean, the camera kind of distorts his color. Yeah, so you do see him being more green in real life because I see him like a sandy color. Yeah, I know. The camera picks up um, the color different, but he's, he's actually like an olive kind of green. Okay, cool. Yeah, then I'll go ahead and go in the here. Blotchy, he does have this blotchy, sandy color, but um, kind of yeah. whitish, but. Cool. Well, it's up to you guys. You guys can pick whatever color you want. It's yeah. your painting. But I'll go ahead and get started then. So, legless lizard, wait, I thought he was a snake. What's the difference, Miguel? 
Well, the main difference you could tell is um, in the head. As you can see, we're talking earlier, um, he can blink, he does have an eyelid. And I'm trying to see if the camera will pick it up. He has um, an opening behind his eye. Mm -hmm. See that opening that's right, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, being legless, he's not, um, he's, he jumps. So he's got a side hole right there. I don't know if you can see it, pick it up on the camera. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. So don't forget yeah, to add that. That's his external ear opening. Snakes don't have that either. He's got a different type of tongue. He's got a thick, fleshy tongue, unlike snakes that have that thin, long fork tongue. Yeah. Also, um, when you were you know showing the sketch and you were showing the lateral line, I'll show you the lateral line right here. You can see the line. Oh, but yeah. See, but you can see where it ends right here, right? It ends right there. And that basically says that's where his um, body ends. And see it from here. And then the rest is all tailed. Got it. So he's mostly all tail versus and the most snakes are all body and very little tail after their vent or their ploica. Um, Got it. Versus um, legless lizards, you know, half their length is usually comprised of their tail. I see. And so, I mean, I'm sure the the mistake is people always call him a snake, right? Yeah, he he's the he's the curveball in our collection. When we when he's out and about and something like, oh, that's a I've never seen that kind of snake before, and we were like, well, he's actually not a snake; he's a lizard. And people are like, what? People are amazed that um that there are such things as legless lizards. And some people don't even know that we have like five different types of lizards, legless lizards here in California, except they're way tinier. They're about five to seven inches in length. And they're very, what we call, um, they're earthworm-like. They're very much always under the soil and the ground, eating small little bugs. Um, they don't even come close to the size of the European legless lizard which I have here. So you hardly see them at all. You'd actually have to be maybe gardening or going through and maybe uncover one. But half the time, people always think they uncovered some kind of weird earth one. Wow. And so how did you guys acquire him then? Because that sounds really special. Uh, Legos was acquired by the um, one of my, before I came here, it was, he was gotten from another uh, reptile collection who no mm -hmm. longer could um, wanted to keep him. So they thought that, you know, being a Lego sister, he'd be a good educational um, animal ambassador. So they um, adopted him, so to speak. So Legolas has been here for about almost eight to nine years here at Kidspace. Got it. And so another question, I guess, would be, did he ever, did they ever have legs? And what happened? Yeah, apparently several million years ago, um, there's a type of lizard called, called skinks that um, I guess at that time they decided the kind of environment that they lived in was probably, which was, they're guessing it was like more uh, loose sandy soil kind of, um, or substrate. And so they felt it was a good adaptation to drop the legs like snakes did and go legless. But that was like, you know, maybe 60 million years ago or something like that. It's been a while when they went since they've gone legless. So the difference is that they still have the same characteristics as a lizard, but mm -hmm. then, vis I mean, visually, they just look more like a snake. Yeah. If you kind of look at their head and people in the audience who have seen alligator lizards, you know, they kind of have the same kind of look to their face. Except, you know, they just have tiny, you know, legless um, alligator lizards have just four, you know, short, really um, short legs, but really long tails also. And, but they also kind of, you know, they, when they, when you see them run, they very run like in the serpentine motion of kind of like a snake. So a lot of people think that they're seeing snakes too, but it's actually just an alligator lizard just whipping through the brush, just trying to get away, thinking that you're going to catch them. Got it. So I guess you guys, as you can see in some of the details I'm putting in, it's based on what Miguel is actually telling us. So the specifics would be this cool little ear hole here. Make sure that your little guy has uh, eyelids. So I'm sure that's for protection, right? Uh huh. Yep. And who are their who who are their predators? Who's looking out for them and trying to make them their next snack? Well, in their native environment, it's generally um, foxes, um, birds of prey. Uh, Cats, various species, just you know, feral cats and you know, small cat species that live out there. So mainly those are the top three: foxes, cats, and birds of prey. Got it. And while you guys are noticing, I'm I'm, I'm actually, even though we didn't talk about it, Miguel, I know that there's obvious scales on him, right? Yeah, you can see that they're pretty much uniform. Like they're they're more like bony plates, is what they have, which Got is it. Different, different than lizards. And 
what with the belly, um, you know, with the people is that do they have scoots like snakes? But no, like if you see the pattern here of their scales, they don't change. It's a different color, but see, they're just they're very similar. There's no long, you know, long rectangular scoots like snakes have. Yeah. So they don't move the same way, and they don't move exactly the same way snakes do. Got it. Especially and since if you, it's all tail, they can have that same serpentine motion that snakes easily could do. Got it. And um, would you say he's a really friendly, this this snake, is he friendly? Is he comfortable with you? Um, actually, he's always, since um, he's very, as you see, he just kind of drifts and jumps. Being mm -hmm. a legless lizard, meaning that he's terrestrial, always on the ground. He doesn't really appreciate being lifted off the ground. So sometimes he'll just kind of, um, he'll jump or he'll twist on me. Mm -hmm. um, so he's he tolerates handling. He doesn't really, I could say, like enjoy it. But mm -hmm. I've been working with him like for three years now. So he's more accepting of me than other people. Um, if another person would be handling them, he'd probably be like spinning and, you know, jumping and whipping around, just like basically saying, let me down. <laughs> yeah. And then what, what color is his habitat usually, Miguel? Like, where is he hiding out at? Um, they're usually like in, in their native habitat, they're like in rocky, sandy areas, you know, or they go to very, or they like to go to agricultural areas because one of their favorite foods is like snails and slugs. So they'll look for places that are very like agriculture based. Mm -hmm. And that's what they'll take out. And a lot of farmers who finally realize what they are, they actually appreciate them on their property because, um, they take care of all the slugs and snails that eat all their plants. That's great. And I think to round out like all of the animals that we showcase for the most part have been very wild. And a lot of people think that they're nuisances, but they're actually here helping cleaning up mm -hmm. and kind of cleaning all of the other animals that maybe the carcasses and just making sure that everything kind of is balanced, right? Yep. Like even like it's, you know, like the snakes, you know, people are like, what's the purpose? Well, they keep all the rodents under control or so we'd have a ton of rodents around. Absolutely. So um, what other cool facts do can we talk about with them really quickly that makes them unique from basically snakes, right? Yeah, so besides other than having no legs, which is like basically their main, um, it's this tail, you know, which I see like, like you see like this is where his body ends because this is where the lateral line ends and you can see like how much of it's all tail. Mm -hmm. so like going, 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 going. And, yeah and um they've been known they're um they're another common name for them is the glass lizard because they can actually um basically break their um tail off at different segments that they want to it's interesting yeah. that they have that nerve control of all the break points in their tail where they could actually break it off at certain points or um but it's not frail like glass you know like if you drop them he could stress out and drop his tail just from dropping them but it, it wouldn't break like glass would break. It would actually be its decision to want to drop its tail. Wow. You could drop it from any point. Like if he just wants to drop the tip, he could drop the tip. You know, if he's really panicked, like if a bird's got him, sometimes they decide to drop the whole um, the whole tail because it gives the predator the perception like it's got it because it's got this long um, wiggly thing in its beak or mouth or whatever. And it yeah. gives the next to him the time to just you know just squirm away and you know break free and escape and live another day that's so cool so it tricks it tricks it's uh the predator right and yeah so it just doesn't fall it falls and it starts like wiggling like crazy it just starts you know just like wiggle 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 and then that's and the movement is usually what a predator goes towards so that's usually what they go for and then he just you know tries to casually slink away while it's being entertained by its drop tail i see that's cool and then lastly miguel what color are their eyes um, their, their pupils are solid black and, okay. um, so there's the, <laughs> there's the, the running that he does. Come on, let me, let me see if I can show you. Yeah. Um, can you get closer? Yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. So this is the time I'd say, guys, you could take out a pen, a marker. I mean, you could use a watercolor, but definitely he's solid black. So I'm going to go ahead and just do that with a pen. Very cool. And do they have really good eyesight? Yes, they do. They have good eyesight. They're they're mostly diurnal. They're interactive at night. I mean, during the day, mm -hmm. um, and they actively hunt. You know, insects, maybe small baby mice and stuff. If they come across a you know rodent's nest, um, they'll even eat like little um, reptile eggs, maybe even another lizard. But um, they prefer snails and slugs, and they'll eat. They're opportunistic, so they'll eat pretty much what they'll come across. So they'll eat crickets, worms, 
um, other types of insects, beetles. Very cool. So I feel like I went in the same color scheme here, Miguel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really, I, he's so cool. I'm so glad that we're talking about him. And you can see him at Kids Space, right? Yeah, that's correct. He's on display. He's on an exhibit. Yep. That's so he's cool. Usually active, so you'll never, he's usually active, except today he was hiding because it was overcast and rainy. But for the most part, he's very active throughout the day while we're open. Yeah, that's so neat. Um, I know Michelle has some really cool trivia on the legless lizard coming up for everyone. Cool. I do. This is the exciting time, I think. Um, okay, so Miguel just answered this question, so we'll see how many were actually listening. When <laughs> is the legless lizard most active? Is it at dusk, at dawn, throughout the day, or throughout the night? I know, Miguel just said it too. Right. Yeah, either I'm looking at the lizard or, or painting, but I will yeah. say I'm going to go ahead and close it. Most everybody said throughout the day. So Yay. we've got some really good multitaskers. Yep. Okay. So. Um, true or false question, the tail starts at the cloaca. Oh, and I just realized I spelt that word wrong. <laughs> Was that just you or someone pointed it out? No, just me. I looked at it right now closely and I spelt cloaca wrong. Yeah, it should be an A and oh. As long as you caught it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well. Uh, so it's a split, it's a 60 40 decision on true or false. Miguel, I'm going to let you take this one. Well, it actually starts, it's kind of a trick question. Yes, it kind of starts at the end of the tail because it, I don't know if you could see it. Um, here's the line, and then it's hard to see his vent because it kind of matches his pattern. But yeah, this cloaca is right here. And then just past the cloaca is all tail, because uh, second like, we have man, to man, don't talk. He's like, so man, don't talk to about my tail like that. Yeah. So yeah, you see, I don't know if you can see it. So it's basically it's got to start. It technically would have to start past the tail because if he would drop it, technically he would drop his cloaca too and drop this tail. So it'd have to be right. It's just, I mean, it's pretty much right there. As soon as the cloaca is right there, then the tail immediately begins. So it's like right at that point. All right. Um, and our last question: What percentage of legless lizards lay eggs? Okay. Uh, Twenty-five percent, fifty percent, seventy-five percent, or a hundred percent? Hmm. Oh, it's all answers are all over the place. A good question yeah all right so we're gonna go ahead and close the poll in three two one and those of you that said 50 percent are absolutely correct half of them lay eggs and half of them give live birth wow cool here's another two so, question it just depends, yeah. it just depends on the species yeah. very cool um, so a question that we have from the audience. So if he was led outside to hunt for to hunt for food, would he come back the same way a cat or a dog does? The lizard? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, probably not. Nope. He would just go out foraging and he'd go, they first seek shelter because that's usually what they do. And then they start looking for food, but they rarely come back. If you lose them within your house, Yes, like if it's loose in your house, most hey, there is a chance it'll come back to the general area of the enclosure. But once they get out, and if you get out past the house, chances are they don't, they won't come back. They have um, they're born with just kind of instincts. They're not, they're not really into. Um, they don't see the house as home. There's just it was a place they were kept. So if they're free, then they'll be like, I'm free, and I'm gonna go out and do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like some kind of like some dogs too. Once the dog gets out of the 
fence, they just take off. Some uh, cats too. Lonnie's like, Lonnie's like that too. She's like, I'm the free spirit. You can't keep me inside. <laughs> yeah. Legless. She so, has I don't know like, with the lizard yay. <laughs> I take my cat out on a leash because sometimes I'm afraid if I do let him out, I'm very skeptical that he'll come back, even though he gets treated really well here. <laughs> He's an adventure cat, for sure. Well, I'm really excited, you guys. Thanks so much for this. And I hope we see some of our friends' artwork. Always remember to sign your artwork, you guys. I always forget. So make sure to sign your work so people know it's from you. And we hope that we see you again. We have a lot of in-person programming coming in 2022, and you can see actually all three of us in various programming, hopefully in the future. And yeah, yeah I hope and I, I, do want to, I do want to let everybody know that all of our programming, um, our Kids for Animals, which is on Mondays and Wednesdays now, and our Academy is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Each one of those programs is going to have some type of art component um so this wasn't the only place that you can get the art we do want to we hope to see everybody you know in person because i see lots of names online that i recognize throughout the what almost two years that we've been doing this now wow um, yeah so yeah i see a lot of the same names and so i hope to actually meet you guys in person and see what one of our programs yeah, and Miguel, thank you so much. Thanks to Kidspace for being a part of this partnership. We really appreciate it. Is there anything, I mean, you can see the amazing Miguel at Kidspace as well. Is there, are there any other programmings coming up for you guys that you wanted to talk about at all? Yeah, actually, we're going to be having a winter camp for kids at Kidspace. Um, enrollment's already online at kids, kidspacemuseum.org. Um, spots are filling up fast, so I don't know if there's still any left, but I know it was very it's the first time we do a winter camp. We normally just do summer camp, so it should be fun. And we're having a winter frolic thing, so we actually have a sock ice skating rink right now out front, so in our main courtyard, mm -hmm. so people want to come and ice skate without the cold ice. You just put on your pair of socks and have fun. We got music <laughs> in the background, DJ music in the background, all that stuff, so it's a lot of fun. So very festive winter frolic kind of thing right now. So if you're into winter and Christmas and all that good stuff that comes along with it, come check it out. And you can see awesome. me along with all the cool animals that we have here too. Awesome, sweet. Well, thank you again, guys, and uh, have a great new year and happy holidays to everybody. Yeah, happy here. holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks Bye -bye. for having me. Take care. Bye.